Hi, this is Mark Rabin from Kinexus, and this is an updated version of some bonus content. It's called How to Create a Control Chart, otherwise known as a Process Behavior Chart. I'm a senior advisor with Kinexus. I'm also the author of a new book released here in August 2018 titled Measures of Success, React Less, Lead Better, improve more. This new book is about this process behavior chart methodology that can be used uh, for managing metrics, more importantly, managing your improvement efforts, prioritizing what you're responding to in your metrics and your charts. So I'd encourage you to um, check out the book for um, kind of a you know, more complete version this was originally uh, bonus content for a webinar, and you can still find this webinar in the Kinexus archive uh, at kinexus.com slash webinars. You can find it on our YouTube channel. This is a, there was a, a full hour webinar titled How to Manage Your Improvement Metrics More Efficiently and Effectively. Jeff Roussel uh, was kind enough to play host. And that webinar, if you go and look at it, is kind of a higher level approach to um, why and how this methodology is useful um, for the purposes of the time. And some people aren't interested in the detail really of how to create the charts. They're really more interested in how to use the charts over time. So we carve this out um, as bonus content. And I'm, I'm updating it just slightly from January 2017, um, not just to throw in mention of my new book, but just a couple other tweaks, you know, as I, dug deeper into this methodology and read um, some of the late, latest publications. There are a few, uh, a few things here that uh, you may disagree with in, in terms of how to evaluate the charts. I'll try to highlight that and explain that a little bit um, here in this, uh, in this session. So a lot of organizations ask, you know, why measure? It's not just because we have to measure. Measures should tell us not only if we're meeting a goal or a target, it should also be asking an important question of, are we improving? How can we use charts to turn an opinion about improvement into something that's a little bit more uh, mathematically valid? We can use statistics, simple methods. Uh, it's really, it's arithmetic, not calculus. We can use methods to um, really help answer some of these questions. Do we have a real significant and sustained shift in our metric? One thing I looked at, and you know, I use this example in workshops and in the book, is the question of, is my blog traffic increasing? I have uh, my own blog at leanblog.org. Um, I'd also invite you to check out um, the Kinexus blog at blog.kinexus.com. I'm sometimes a contributor to that. We've got a great team of people writing and sharing a lot of really interesting stuff there. But, you know, that might not be the most important question um, for my business. Is blog traffic increasing? It's, it's something that's got uh, ready measures and, and data readily available. That doesn't make it the most important metric. You know, uh, it kind of begs the question of, you know, whether blog traffic really leads to increased revenue and, and higher profits for my um, consulting practice, but it is what it is. We'll use uh, this data set to help demonstrate um, the process behavior chart method. Process behavior charts are really a subset of control charts or statistical process control charts. Um, if you want to dig deeper, you're looking at textbooks about um, these charts, it's also called an individual's control chart because we're plotting individual data points like metrics or things that can be counted uh, on a daily, weekly, monthly, even annual basis. So for step one, we want to get our initial data. So you can see here I've got uh, days of the week. I've got uh, data points for the number of page loads. We generally want 20 data points to calculate our process behavior limits to calculate an average level of performance. Um, 20 data points is good for a baseline. Going to 25 or 30 is a little bit more valid statistically, but it, there's diminishing returns that come from 
the size of uh, the baseline data set. If you've got as few as six data points or eight data points, you can create what you might call a provisional chart. Uh, as you add more data points, you might recalculate the average and the limits up until you get those 20. Um, so you, know, you, you don't want to be continually recalculating your average and um, the limits unless there's a shift in the system, unless there's some significant change and what we'll see an example of what that looks like later. So if you've got limited data, you can start with a, a process behavior chart that's not quite as valid, but it's good enough uh, as a starting point. And then you might notice within the data, I've excluded weekends. That's arguably a different system. People aren't at work, traffic is much lower on weekends. Um, I, I thought a better apples to apples comparison over time or what you might call a rational subgroup in statistician speak. Um, that rational subgroup might be the weekdays. Now I'd be curious as I plot the data, do holidays have an effect on those weekdays? We don't know until we make the chart. So step one is that we've gathered that initial data. You can see I've just put this into um, Excel. And if you go to my book's website, measuresofsuccessbook.com, there is an Excel template that you can download. There's all kinds of uh, useful stuff like that. Or you can build one from scratch, which is why I'm showing these formulas. So in step two, we calculate the mean or the average of our baseline data, those first 20 data points. That's just a simple Excel function. And then we also calculate something called a moving range. So if we have 20 data points, we have a moving, well, there, there are 19 moving ranges. So we are calculating the difference between each two consecutive data points. We're using the absolute value function because this is always a positive number. How much is it changing? Which then gives us a measure of what our uh, inherent routine variation is from day to day in this baseline period because as I talked about in the full webinar, we want to start distinguishing between signals in our metric, something that's signaled uh, that the system has changed versus noise or fluctuation in a metric. So step three is that we draw our initial chart. We've got our data in blue. We've got the average drawn as a horizontal line in green. And so we see, well, yeah, it's fluctuating around that average. Uh, you know, roughly half the data points are below average, half are above. You know, it's not always going to be 50-50 uh, in a fluctuating metric. But this is where we start realizing, you know, a consistent process will sometimes generate variable results. There is variation in every metric, and a process behavior chart helps us um, see that. So here's a chart with the average. Well, the next thing we're going to do is calculating what are either called simply just lower limits and upper limits. They're sometimes called control limits. I've been using the term natural process limits. Um, that, that is part of this process behavior chart methodology. And so the way we calculate those, and I'll show you what it means, you know, we calculate the average of the moving ranges for our baseline data period that average of the moving ranges is 293. So on average, on a daily basis, the, the blog traffic could be going up or down. Um, it's changing on average about 293 page loads per day. And then we calculate the lower and upper limits are symmetrical around the average. We can do, use two forms of the formula, plus or minus. So it's the average plus or minus three times the MR bar divided by 1.128, or more simply, it's plus or minus 2.66 times the MR bar, the average plus or minus that. Why, it, you know, if this is an approximation of plus or minus three sigma limits, why do we use the statistical constant of 1.128? I'm gonna to defer to the PhD statisticians, and I'm gonna suggest that as practitioners of the chart, that's not really important. What's more important is how we use the charts over time. So now here's the chart with our uh, data, our average, and our symmetrical lower and upper control limits. So we're looking to see, are there any signals 
we're close. We don't have any signals, which tells me this is what we would call a predictable system. Moving forward, I could predict that the daily weekday blog traffic is going to fall between the lower and upper limits. On average, it's going to be roughly 1,500 and something. So we're looking to see, first off, do we have a stable, predictable system? Then we're going to evaluate what happens over time as we add additional data points. So I'm telling you here, there are no signals. Let's take a look at the rules for um, finding a signal. So here are three rules for finding a signal in a metric. So this is showing uh, a different metric from a different setting, but you can see how we had data fluctuating around an average, and now we have a data point lower than the lower natural process limit. So we could call this a rule one signal. When we see a signal, it's appropriate to ask what changed, what happened, so that we can um, you know, uh, react. And if this, uh, you know, if higher is better on this chart, we want to understand what caused performance to drop so we can eliminate that root cause and get performance back to where it had been, if not making things um, a little bit better. So there we go, a single data point above or below the limits. Our second rule is looking for a run of eight or more consecutive data points that are either above or below the average. So this is unlikely to happen randomly. It's another signal that something has changed in the system. And we probably now see a shift where the metric is fluctuating around a different average than before. So that's rule two. Rule three calls for um, you know, three out of four, which could mean three consecutive data points that are closer to the same limit than they are to the average. We can call that rule three. So any of these, these three things happening tell us that something has changed and that's a good time to go investigate and figure out why. So let's go back to our blog traffic. So it's fluctuating around this average, within these limits, we would predict that uh, performance is going to continue to fluctuate within the, these ranges unless something changes. So as we add more data points over time, we see this and we realize, okay, we've got um, a signal. We've got a run of you know, far more than eight consecutive points above the average. So that's indicative that something has changed that means um, the blog is getting more traffic. It could be because of Google search results. It could be because of the type of content I was writing. Uh, it could be, you know, who knows. Um, the, uh, the process behavior chart tells you something changed. It doesn't tell us what changed. So we have to rely on our knowledge of the system, going out into the workplace, understanding what changed. So the chart is just a reflection of the reality that something changed in the system. When we ask what happened for these data points within the realm of noise, there is no root cause for that variation. So we see a shift and we may shift the limits if applicable. So we see a range where uh, we've got a, a new higher average. The amount of day-to-day -day variation is about the same, so the lower and upper limits have shifted uh, accordingly. They're maybe just slightly narrower than they were before. It's not a big, huge difference. But the lesson learned here is, you know, we look for shifts in our metric. There is probably no, you know, linear trend line of ongoing continuous improvement. It's more likely that something happened here when this um, shift appears in the metric. So that's some of the basics of how to create a control chart or a process behavior chart. For a deeper dive, I'll point you to a couple of places. One is, you know, the book that I call my, my most favorite book ever. Uh, it's uh, written by Donald Wheeler. He's a PhD statistician. Uh, the book is titled Understanding Variation, The Key to Managing Chaos. And I've learned a lot from Dr. Wheeler. Um, I've, I've read and reread this book and given it away uh, to a lot of people over time. And uh, that led to you know, with the other work that I'm doing, uh, my own book titled Measures of Success, React Less, Lead Better, Improve More. I was honored that Don Wheeler wrote the foreword 
for the book. And this has you know, a lot more information of uh, the webinars here. Um, Peak your interest, the book has more of the background, uh, more examples of this methodology. I, 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 the, the initial reviews of the book are good, I'm happy to say. Um, but, um, I will point you there. You can find more about the book at www.measuresofsuccessbook.com. You can buy it. Um, right now, it's just an ebook um, as of August 2018. You can buy that through Amazon Kindle Store. You can buy it through Apple iBooks. There's another platform called leanpub.com, and I'm also working on a paperback version that should be available here later 2018. But again, you can find links to all of that. I'll update the website, measuresofsuccessbook.com. So again, this has been uh, Mark Rabin from Kinexus. I want to thank you for joining me for this bonus content on how to create a control chart, aka a process behavior chart. I'll post a link um, in the YouTube video um, to that other webinar that I did. I'll post a link to uh, a blog post on our site that has more information about this. Um, so again, this has been uh, Mark Raven. Thank you for checking out this video.